Lovely, and so we are recording. Fantastic, I think. Yes, we're recording. Sorry, normally much better than that. Right, hello. So welcome to uh, week five of our Getting Recruitment Right webinars, um, which is where Brian and myself talk through all the different stages of the recruitment cycle. And this week, our session is... Oops. Um, making the decision and feeding back. So, but before we get into that, I'm Helen Joy. Um, my business is called People Spark. I am a management and leadership consultant, and my focus is generally around the soft skills um, and behaviours that make managers be the best that they can be and help to develop their leadership skills. I do have 15 years of experience in recruitment, both as a recruiter, a recruitment manager and training both recruiters and recruitment managers. So that's where my, um, my two penneth comes from. Um, I'll just hand over to Brian, who will introduce himself before we move on. Thank you, Helen. Um, my business is Ucrit. I set it up just um, under a year ago, and it's a recruitment business advisory specialist. So I do outsource recruitment projects, I do recruitment training, um, I look at recruitment strategies for businesses as well. Um, and do a little bit of work with them on the likes of LinkedIn. So I do, I've got a guide on the LinkedIn algorithm, so how to improve the, the ability to recruit through social media. Um, like Helen, I'm almost 15 years in the industry, and I opened Ucrit because I, I saw a bit of a gap in the market, number one, that there was not many external training uh, facilities that were based on operations, um, and two, that gives a more holistic approach to recruitment rather than this um, kind of parochial, shall we say, um, approach to it. So that's why we, you know, I've done this and speaking to Helen, I've known Helen for a long, long time and we decided to put on this, this webinar series. So thank you for joining us today. Fabulous, thank you. And um, this session is one that I personally feel particularly strongly about. So um, I've warned Brian to tell me to get off my soapbox if I <laughs> if I start on that. Um, and, and I think we, we were talking this morning and, and because the feedback element of, of this part of the equation is seems to be getting worse. And, and for me, I think that will only continue to get worse as the volumes of applicants for roles actually start to increase even further. You know, we've all heard the stories of 2000 people applying for 120 um, Sainsbury's jobs locally and, and you know, 100 people applying for a, a one waiter's job. Um, so the volumes are gonna be an issue for people, but I think there's so many ways that that, that can be managed and that there's so much around that. But as I say, I, I'll try not to get on my soapbox about that too much. So, um, so this is, as I said, this is session five and this is making a decision and feeding back. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about feedback first um, because of the importance of it and because it's something that doesn't seem to be a priority for businesses uh, for a number of reasons but we just want to talk about the the reason why it's so important and how to make that um, something that is part of your process and something that's actually quite simple to do not necessarily easy because the the simple things quite often aren't easy um, but the, the, all the advantages and the benefits of those I'm just going to hand over to Brian. So yeah, thank you, Helen. Um, you know, I think for both of us, this is a, a bit of a, a hot topic because of what's happening, what we read about. And it ties in with the whole social media um, pretext that when I first got into recruitment all those years ago, using things like uh, fax, you know, all those um, really formidable ways of uh, communicating that we were told when we were trained that, you know, if you give bad service, um, you seven people would you did tell seven people. The problem with social media today is you can tell 7 million people very quickly, depending on the, the feedback you've received. Now, I mentioned to you what, you know, what my business was set up for. I have a, a channel as well where I work with what I call private clients. And unlike an agency, I charge my, my clients, and I, I work with them on doing the CV, interview prep, anything to do with their actual job, um, you know, sort of journey. And I've taken two emails that I've, asked, I, I've received this week um, just to show you. Now, the first one um, was one of my private clients who's, who's pretty senior, and he was asked to apply for a, for a job by the CEO. And the first one, as you'll see there, I've emailed asking for further feedback, something more than automated email, no response. 
So you can imagine, this is a senior person in the oil and gas industry who's not very happy. Um, the next one is obviously, we regret to inform you we've selected another more suitable candidate for the role. Thank you for your time in capitals and we'll keep your profile in our database. Now this is one that resonates quite a lot with me because when you're training consultants, managers, even directors, this is the same bit, you know, there's, no, there's, there's minimal SLAs with regard to getting back to people. But even more so, when people have gone through the journey, I now know from doing, doing a very small uh, survey what people expect. So most of the, my private clients I speak to, if they've applied for a job, they don't mind getting an automated message to say you've not been successful, but they would like something a bit more so they can work on that. However, if they've been to interview, they do expect, because they've invested time, for them to get something that's actually by a human being. Now, talking about soapboxes, I mean, we live in a, an age now where things can be automated pretty easily. Um, you don't have to have millions of pounds to, to, to have an automation. And actually, automation is pretty clever that you can send a generic email or message to somebody which can look personalized. Yet in our industry, we, we, just, we just don't do that. And I think that is this, the, the big element for me is you're not trained in it. So I, you know, I've, I've only worked for one large um, recruitment agency. I've not worked for small independents, but I have worked for myself now for a year. So there is a bit of a, an example I can give on both sides, but with the, the, the large, it's not a KPI. It's not something you're targeted on is getting back to your candidates, making phone calls to clients, sending CVs, getting interviews, doing drops, doing marketing. There's a, there's a target for each of these, but yet we don't attribute a target to get back to candidates. We don't set a time scale. And I don't believe many businesses do that either. So it's not just a bit of recruitment bashing here. This is actually us as an industry getting back to job seekers, whether that's a direct application or something where you know, we have gone through an agency or a third party. And I believe most of that is down to lack of training, lack of guidance, because as Helen mentioned at the outset, nobody wants to give bad news. You know, if you think about this from a, from a personal point of view, if you think about a real tragedy, when you've lost somebody close to you or, and you've got to tell another family member or a friend, it's horrible. It's horrible. And I mean, I'll give you, and I, I smile about this and it's not a bit of, I feel sorry for you. My, my father passed away a long, long time ago, 30 years ago. People still say, what does your dad do? And I'll say, he passed away. And you can see their face. Oh, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Actually, don't be. You don't need to be. It's all good. But people are scared of bad news. Now, I'm going to a, a very different level, a very personal level there. But it is the same when someone's applying for a job. I don't want to take back to them. I don't know how to phrase this. And we touched on this a, a couple of sessions ago uh, on bias. And a lot of times bias plays a big part with regard to feedback because we've picked a candidate, which Helen will come to, or the decision-making element that we want in our business. So we want either our candidate as an agency or as a direct applicant, we like them. So how do we feed back to others? And this is the bit I, this little 10 point plan, nine, 10 point plan is based on that, that people don't think of very easy ways to feed back. Honesty, you hear this, the, the, the old adage, honesty is the best policy. Well, be honest, be timely. Again, I was saying to Helen earlier, I have a, a private client who was interviewed last Monday for a senior marketing role. She's still waiting today. Her thoughts are she's not got the job. She may have the job, we don't know. But actually, you're talking about 10 days between having an interview and still not hearing something. In 2020, that's personally unforgivable because why is it taking that length of time? Avoid cliches. You know, we... You were a strong candidate, but we felt we had someone stronger. What does that mean? You know, what's a strong candidate? And um, praise them. So looking at the elements, actually, they've done well through the interview because this is a this is a critique. They've not got the job. It's not a pleasant conversation. But you should be saying to people what where they've, they've got a good strength. Inform them. So tell them you know what they can do differently. So this is the bit where feedback is a gift. And again, I'm now using a cliche. So. I need to go back to number three and uh, have a word with myself and avoid cliches. But, you know, it is that bit. What can you inform them that can help them on their journey if they've not been successful through you as a consultant or through you as a direct application? Be prepared. So, again, 
are you making these calls to these you know unsuccessful candidates with five minutes to go before you go into a meeting before you have to go and uh, clock off for the day before you have to pick up your kids whatever it may be it shouldn't be on the hop it should be something you're prepared to do and you know what you're going to say to people be brief so something I need to advise myself on again, don't go into some sort of big long tale about, well, you know, at the interview, we try to do that. It's a case of, you know, short, sharp ways of saying, do you know what, actually, this is why we chose somebody else. This is what you could do. And, you know, we wish you all the best. Be factual. Again, we talked about the bias element and that's, the, that's one of the problems. How do you feed back when really the reason the person's not got the job is because of, a, unconscious bias, or possibly worse, genuine bias. Oh, I didn't like the school they've gone to. I really wanted a woman in this time, not a guy. Um, oh, I don't know if actually they would move across on the other side of the world to come and work with us. All of these are, are, are assumptions. All of these are, are, are decisions you're making without any real authority. And then that's very hard to feed that back to somebody. And then thank them. So leave. I My view has always been leave that conversation on a positive, leave it open. Because they may be your fifth candidate or even your eighth candidate, but who knows in a year, two, three years time where that person may be and what they can add to, to your business then. And I think going back, speaking to a lot of people because of the nature of, of one of the elements of my, of my business, this is what they're all crying out for. People actually are saying, we want feedback. You can flip it. And I do understand the the pitfalls of saying something you don't want to say, or you think, oh, we, you know, if I say that, I might have a lawsuit on my door. Well, possibly, but if you if that's the case, then you've probably done something wrong within the process. If you're if you are worried about getting a lawsuit, um, I don't think anybody is. I think that's me again going to the extreme. But similarly, it comes back down to the, the part we mentioned a couple of sessions ago with regard to bias in the recruitment process. And I think that if you can with Take bias out of that. And when you're feeding back, you can give people something they can work on. They're much more likely to, to actually say, do you know what? That's a great agency. That's a wonderful consultant. If that, was, if that job comes up with that company again, I would apply. Because actually, it's, it's like everything we get. It's that journey we're all on as consumers. And this is, this is a bit consumerist, what people do now, because there's so much online applying for a job is a bit like going to the shops you've got lots of options you've got lots of job boards you've got lots of companies you've got lots of agencies so there's an element there that the candidate can move and the candidate can tell a lot of people influential people and i think that something we are we're so scared of is something we should be training on working with each other as as industry leaders how do we improve feedback for, for, for job seekers to improve the candidate experience applying for jobs. And that's not saying your agency or my agency or Helen's agency. That is a, a holistic approach to recruitment. And it hopefully something if we get enough people together, kind of industry leaders or senior people in the, in the industry. And I know we've got quite a few people on the call today who've, this isn't their first uh, go in the merry-go-round, shall we say. Um, but if we can get together and say, how do we improve that? And how do we start to influence others? Because my other bit to finish off before I hand over to Helen is the one thing with regard to the industry of recruitment rather than direct applications for business, we're in a non-regulated industry. Anybody can set up an agency. Anybody can claim to be a recruitment consultant specialist, but few are. Few have been around that merry-go-round more than once and if we can get the senior people to say, do you know what, this is, we expect we will start to clean up, I suppose, the indifferent reputation that recruitment sometimes has in certain areas of the world. So I'm off my soapbox now. I'll let <laughs> Helen go on to hers. Hers is much higher, just so you know. <laughs> I've, um, yeah, I snuck an extra slide in, Brian. Um, <laughs> <I> just, <laughs> um, just, just to kind of... Um, so follow up on that is that 94% um, of candidates, sorry, my, what's going on there? 94% of candidates want feedback and it's probably that 6% are the ones that get it, um, if I was being really cynical. So it's something like, as Brian said, that the market's crying out for. And actually there's 
masses of benefits to your business, whether you are a, an agency or whether you are a, a, a business, you know, it improves your brand awareness, whether you're, you know, if people are coming away going, oh, I applied for this job through X agency, never heard anything back. And their colleague, friend, whatever is going, oh, I applied through Ucrew. And actually I got really good feedback really quickly. Um, yeah, it's amazing how different that perception is and then that kind of is going oh actually I'll go and talk to them then I'll go and see you know if I know there's a job here I'll go and tell them because I want to go via them because I know they do things differently um it means the candidate says Brian said can make positive changes if they're doing something in an interview it's your human responsibility to tell them what they can do better and how they can change because potentially they're going to get they're going to make the same mistake in the next interview, which means they're going to have the same problem and they're never going to get anywhere. And if it's one little thing that you can change, then actually you're doing them a massive, massive favour. As Brian said, they're more likely to apply in future. Um, and it, that enables you to retain that positive ongoing relationship with them. If we talked um, right back in the first session about creating a talent bench of people who want to work for your business, that's not going to happen if you have a terrible follow-on process if you don't give feedback, if you don't keep in touch with people. Um, and also it can make that process faster. If your decision-making and feedback is a slick process that can make you more competitive to candidates because you're going through that process faster. You're making decisions quicker. You're feeding back quicker. Even if it's a case of when you interview the first time, nobody's quite right. If you fed back to them, you go straight back out to market and do that process again. Um, so yeah, that's just my little peek on the soapbox for that because I, I just think it's one of those things that is so important. Um, but so now I will move on to making the decision. And this actually is so, oh, I got a bit excited there. Um, making a decision. It, should be a really straightforward process. It should be really simple to do. Even if you have got six candidates that you've interviewed who are all great at that job. And again, it comes back to what we talked about in session one, which is the preparation that goes into the recruitment process and the interview. So if you have had a, an interview process and a recruitment process that has prepared because you understand exactly what skills you need for that role. You know exactly what the outputs of that role are. You know exactly what that role is going to deliver you in your business plan and your strategy moving forward. If during the interview, you've used a scoring process based on competency or behavioral questions that has been scored objectively and independently, ideally by more than one person, and then assessed alongside each other, there is every likelihood that one person will edge ahead um, based on all the other things then if you think about sort of salary ranges and, and that type of thing. But the decision-making fundamentally comes down to the preparation and the work that you've put into the process so far. So if you've got that data in front of you, and if you've got two or three candidates who are all pretty much neck and neck, it is a case then of actually listing the pros and cons of each of those candidates within that role. And that, again, is sticking to the factual objective data, because this is where the bias can creep in. And this is where you've got to be so careful that when you're looking at two or three candidates who are all on a par, you have to be very, very aware of what your own biases are and how you're looking through that lens to compare those candidates to each other. But again, if you've got more than one person involved, then you're looking at that slightly differently, hopefully. I think as well, Helen, just to jump in, I think what was interesting, I, I was involved in an interview panel in the summer for a pretty senior role, and they, they prejudiced the, the whole interview then because at the end of each interview, comments were made. And they were off-the-cuff comments. They went, they went derogatory towards anybody. But there were comments about, oh, I like her. She has this. He didn't have that. They didn't. And all of a sudden, before you score, I mean, we're going back a little bit, but you're making a decision without having all the facts because you actually, there is a touch 
of prejudice there because you should really be scoring something. As Helen says, looking at the start, what was the job description? What is the spec? Why are we interviewing? Are we scoring this correctly? And that will help make the decision because if you are doing that, you're effectively, whether it's, you know, and it probably is likely to be more than one person, you're influencing somebody else. Oh, Helen, what did you think of Matthew? He was, he was great, wasn't he? Oh yeah, he's my favorite, definitely. You know, there's, a, there's, there's something in there where actually we've not sat and scored it. And I think the problem is decision-making is the end process. It's not the, you know, this is not like in recruitment closing. We're not always closing. We're not always making decisions here. We are doing this right at the end to actually say, this is the best candidate for our business based on. So I, I think that's also interesting to, to where the, the decision-making process can be prejudiced depending it's on- like you're, It's that. almost like you're being auto-suggestive uh, before you've completed the process yeah. you know you're you're um it's almost like you're subliminally putting a thought in somebody's head before um they've actually consciously come to that conclusion themselves so again i, I agree with with that um analysis there brian is that you know it's if this is to be a pure process then those sort of types of water cooler comments uh, should be kept uh, kept out of things until the the process has, has been sort of um, fairly uh, decided um, and I think that you know that's quite a valid comment mm -hmm. and especially with someone else who's not come in yet you've maybe seen three yeah. of the five but number three is just blown you away it's very hard for person number four and person number five to come in under that duress they will <laughs> You're going to have to be all singing, all dancing. It's like watching a place in the sun. I, I love that program. You can always tell when you buy the house. I love this one. You don't have to show them anymore. That's enough because they've, they've made the decision. And it's no different, albeit using something that's a bit more fun of buying a house, but it's no different to saying, well, actually, if you're saying that about number th the, you know, candidate number three, you are making candidate number four and candidate number five basically, they don't use the word redundant, but there's no point in them coming in because you've, as you mentioned, Matthew, that water cooler chat or that subliminal influencing of all, oh, number four will have to do a hell of a lot more to, you know, to get the job if, you know, <laughs> they have to blow me away rather than just walk through the door and be themselves. So thank you. Absolutely. And, and I think another, <laughs> I'm in danger of getting on another soapbox here. Um, <laughs> the delivery of the offer. Um, when you have decided, who your chosen candidate is, please do not take this opportunity to say, we can probably get them for a couple of grand less, especially if they're not working. Oh, because you can go through this process, you can have this entire wonderful, brilliant process where somebody's really engaged, they're really bought in, and then you make them an offer that's three grand under, the top level of the salary range or rank, well, sorry, range, or they are, it's not what you, it's not what you know they want. It is always, for me, this is about, and this is something to have a, you know, sometimes have a discussion within the interview process is understanding what their expectations are around salary, because if their salary expectations are significantly separate from what your budget is for that particular role and if you've worked with an agency and it's a good agency they should have highlighted that for you at the beginning and made it very clear that the skill set you're going to get for that salary range um, but it's making sure that offer that is the point that somebody is committing to you it's like when you ask someone to marry you you're not going to do it with a you can't you can't do it anymore they wouldn't fit coke can ring i mean you might do if you're really romantic but you know that is this is a, a massive point in their life and it's going to be something that if they stay with you for a long time or however long they're there it's going to impact on how they feel yeah. about wanting to be part of your organization and if they do not feel valued and appreciated for what they're bringing at this point even if they do accept, if you have to negotiate, their level of commitment to you will be completely different. This should be a massive excitement moment for both you and the candidate. And it should be something that is celebrated and exciting and not something that turns into a hostage negotiation. And, and, and also as, as an agency recruiter, puts you in a really horrible position that makes you have some really uncomfortable, horrible conversations 
that you could have had with a candidate, with a client and the candidate way before. Um, so, you know, make it a really positive thing, because if that person comes back and says, yes, this is the start of a whole wonderful relationship between you and that person. And it means that their commitment to your business will be significantly higher. Um, and then interesting, actually, I'm going to ask, I'm going to feed over to, to Brian for this, because I haven't been in direct recruitment for, for a little while. Where, where, so obviously references you then, most places you don't get until you've made that offer and they are all contingent on references. How much of an impact do they play? In well, I, I think I had, a, I had a bit of a joke with a client yesterday. I said in recruitment, if someone sends you a, a good reference through, you know not to hire the person. If they send you a bad reference, they're in. Uh, no, I think that what's what probably has happened, and I'm sure when we open to the Q and A, you you'll all have a, a view and opinion as well. But I feel that the a bit like feedback um, to applicants who have not been successful, references have changed over the years, and it's just dates. It's just dates, and I, I don't know many candidates, and I've on a kind of personal level, I've seen people who have worked for me who have maybe been dismissed for for, for something pretty s serious. And they've shown up at a big agency a couple of weeks later. So my, my thought is that they've been given dates and nothing much more. I'm not sure how, how relevant they are. I think it would depend on the, on the client you're working with. Um, but most, again, a lot of people will just say, um, I've had it before, could you be my reference? So I have, for instance, a, a lady who worked for me for a few years. She, I'm now her referee, even though I, you know, I was a line manager two and a half years ago, but that's the way she liked it to happen. So, I don't really think it's it's as it plays as big a deal maybe as it did ten years ago, where it probably do, is still as relevant as anything in the public sector, because public sector really go to the you know the eighth degree to make sure references are are squared off, um, and I suppose Helen as well. The question would be how is somebody seeking references? Is it you know the old read way used to be we had a, a verbal reference, we had a written reference. Um, and then you had a, a kind of a verbally written reference where you would make notes um, of what the person said. But in my latter time within mainstream recruitment, it wasn't something that kind of came to the, the fore as much. Um, and just one other little bit, just on what you were talking about before. I think you've mentioned here on the fourth bullet, delivery of the offer. Again, I've heard through my, my years, both with, with clients and both with my, my own teams, the delivery of the offer, how you say something is vitally important. And we now have this phenomenal situation in 2020 of having video conferencing. I'd be interested to know how many people make offers to their client candidates on a video conference rather than a call. And the reason why the, this comes to mind, I had a guy who used to work for me many years ago, a guy called Richard Parfit. And just to give him a little bit of a, a plug, if you're in Aberdeen ever, there's a, a restaurant called Maggie's Grill. He owns it very worth going to yeah Scott you're nodding I think you've you may have frequented <laughs> wonderful but Richard Richard was a bit of a showman really good about service but the way he delivered offers was just incredible and he would play the card of you get the, the successful candidate and say hi I'm just going to get some feedback how do you think it went and he'd get their input he said well you know oh it's really tough and, you know, and then he would just throw it in there and go, but I'm just going to tell you, you've got the job. And he'd make a big deal. And I remember, and the reason I mentioned him, I had a lot of consultants who've been brilliant at this, but he called this, he was working with a couple and the lady was unemployed and the guy was looking for a, a bigger jump up. And he called them at the same time to deliver the news. He had them go and put the phone between them and they started crying. And weirdly, he started crying. <laughs> Scott, don't mention that to me if you're Maggie's grill. He'll, he'll, he's a big guy, he'll come after me. But it was all about the delivery. And they, they said to him, you've changed our lives and you don't know how much you have. The guy was on 18,000, got a job paying about 28, 30. The lady wasn't working, got a job paying 16. This is 2007, just in case you think we're working with people not paying minimum, minimum wage. Um, but the delivery of this was incredible. And I'd, I'd only been in recruitment for about six months at the time. And I remember thinking, I want him to train every consultant coming in because he made a big deal. Now, on the flip side, and especially I think for, for maybe business owners, for hiring managers who are not recruiters, 
it's also a really good way to work out if this person's invested in taking this job. How often have you made it an offer as a recruiter saying, hi, you know, hi, Helen, here's, okay, mm -hmm, yeah, interesting, mm -hmm. you know there's a sticking block there. So that delivery of, of your tone, of, you know, your passion within the call also holds a lot of, of weight to the, the new contract between possible hire and employer, but also to see if the possible new hire may have an issue with this role. So if you think, you know, Helen's paying 35,000. Oh, oh, mm. you should be aware, your team should be aware. You may have a sticking point there and you want to probably probe a little bit further at that stage. Fabulous, thank you. So in summary, so that's kind of our, our this, this element of it. Um, and, and in summary, the, ugh, it doesn't make, it doesn't take much to be significantly better than a lot of people out there at the moment. And feedback, like everything, the more you get used to doing it, the easier it becomes and the more it feels comfortable. Um, and, and the nine steps that Brian had at the beginning there. So I will email out the slides to anybody if they'd like them. Um, but those nine steps there, I think are absolutely critical to making sure that you give people accurate, timely, factual, specific feedback that they can work on to make sure that they can do better next time. And also to just encourage them to want to engage with your business moving forward and want to be part of, of that with you. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna get stop sharing my screen and then we will go into a conversation element of it. Hello, Mr. Waddle. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> nice to see you hello hello so yeah anybody got any questions or anything to add or um anything to say in there it's uh tom yeah. you've got you've got a lot to say. you've got a lot of experience in this area a <laughs> um, couple of points um so morning everyone and sorry i was late i had some uh, technical difficulties and even though i use video calling every single day i still have problems um, usually at this point I'm on mute as well and people are frantically telling me they can't hear me. Um, so <laughs> hi, hi Brian, good to see you again as well. Um, That's so I think a couple of interesting points for me uh, on feedback and I'm, I'm passionate about the, the candidate journey. It's really something that I've embedded into my, to my own career, um, even though it takes a lot of effort to get back to people. And, and I think you pointed out, Ellen, you know, people are getting two, three, four hundred responses to jobs. Um, slightly off topic a little bit, but I think if people wrote better job adverts and were specific about what they wanted from people, they would probably get less but better, more meaningful response. It's when an advert says, we have a job, please apply here. And then they complain that they got 700 people that weren't suitable because they didn't actually specify what they wanted would be my, my first point. Um, so if you're specific about what you want, you'll probably get more of the relevant people. Um, I see a lot, and I, I've engaged a lot on LinkedIn about getting back to people, and there's a lot of people who have got this um, view that even if you send in a, you know, an application form, a CV, call it what you will, you expect to get you know personal feedback on that application and that's just not viable now i'm coming to this from a standpoint of a real passionate you know candidate experience person um, i get back to pretty much or i get back to everybody it is automated as you said brian it's not difficult to automate the process and what saddens me is the amount of people that get back to me thanking me for saying no um, because people just don't do that and it's almost the exception nowadays that somebody gets a response. So I think I always say to people, you know, set it up. One of the things that I do, similar to, to Brian, is I, I work with individuals yeah. and I work with companies. One of the things I say is train your recruiters to use their, their systems properly. They've all got functionality mm -hmm. that most people... Most, most computers are completely grey. My, my computer's not gone complete. Okay. Um, the, the, the most people um, can actually... Just cover my face up now. Um, but, but most people can automate very, very easily to at least let people know they can cross that application off the list. But when it becomes tricky, is giving that specific feedback that you mentioned, Brian. 
Um, and again, uh, you know, I'm all for um, picking up the phone and, and, and to answer your question, yes, I've delivered good news and bad news by video. Um, but what about where you've got a client, and this is probably to Brian and Helen, that is not so good at giving the feedback, even though you've trained them to tell you specifics, they've done all the scorecards, but the feedback that you get to pass on to your candidate is they had better people. And no matter how much you probe with them, you're not really getting much out. And you're then faced to give really quite anemic feedback to somebody. And what's the answer there where the client just is too busy, doesn't really see the value in it, and gives you feedback that you yourself are a little bit like, mm, it's not great. I, I think that is always the toughest one. Is what do you do? Do you end up telling a bit of a fib? Do you give, as you mentioned, that anemic feedback? Or do you really push the client to say, look, actually, as part of your brand, it's a yeah. really good way. If, if I can go back to them and say X, Y, and Z, I don't need you to give me war and peace. I need to give me the, the one key reason as to why you didn't do it. The one that I would always say, Tom, though, is that you talk about training and systems. I think if, if, a, if a consultant or manager or agency has got a process in place where actually you're having a set time for a feedback session with the client. So it's not done over email. And I, I, I would personally say the issue comes is when you get an email from a client, you know, we, we, we're accepting Tom, everybody else um, has been unsuccessful. That's when you get that, oh my God, what do we say? I've always tried to, where possible, and it doesn't happen every time, is set a time to say to the client, what I'm gonna do is your last interview is at 4 p.m. today. I'm gonna to call you at 9 a.m. tomorrow for a feedback session on the five individuals or three individuals. I would like you to give me a little bit for each and I'm going to then say to them, this was your view because when you personalize feedback, it's a much easier um, way rather than this generic, you know, we thought, well, actually what, what Helen said was you didn't have experience of, you know, SAP implementation um, compared to who we've taken. It's, you're then giving factual back, um, feedback now that, again, Tom, as you'll know more, as, as well as anybody, that doesn't always happen. But I think if you can, at the start of any bit of recruitment, whether it's a campaign or a role, if you can set expectations with your client, and we have someone like Scott who's on the call as a business owner, you know, you, you're trying to make that easy for Scott as well, that he's not, you know, his job isn't to recruit. Well, it, it is, but it's, you know, he's come to you as an agency to, yeah. you know, to do this. But if you can say, listen, Scott, from the start, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. This will be prepared for, and you explain it. I think more often than not, you'll get that feedback. Where my worry lies, Tom, is that we don't have... I still struggle with the word recruitment consultant. There's so many people in the industry are recruitment administrators or CV sifters. The good consultants will say at the start, this is the expectation. Mr. or Mrs. Client, this is our journey together. The recruitment administrators will just go, yes, whatever. Oh, I've got the email. Cool, I'll let them know. And we'll do one of two things, as we know. Anemic feedback, or they'll just tell a whole new story of why they didn't get it, and they'll put their spin on it. But I think if you can set the process out at the start, more often than not, the client will understand the benefit to them. And it's, it's like any transaction, what's in it for them? So if I want MVP to, to be known across there, I'm going to say, my client gives feedback. And that means that the candidates applying will get something. And that's good for your business, Scott, because you're doing something that so many other people are not doing. Yeah. And that, that's a, you know, that's a one-upmanship for, if you talk about brand and the cost of everything, I'd be thinking, wow, that's really good. I went to an interview there and they gave me proper feedback. Yeah, no, I totally and agree. I, think it's a bit of I totally agree with everything you're saying. I think agencies are really good as well because I came from a, my industry that I was in before was professional football and it was ruthless. I mean, it wasn't anything like getting an email. You, you were getting told to your face that you were no Aye. longer wanted. Aye. So I was coming out of that and then going into my own business and thinking, well, what if I don't like so or what do I just say? What I, I've been thinking, I kind of speak to people like that. Do you know? So I think it's really handy as well that you have people that that can help you uh, choose the right candidate for your job. Plus, at the same time, what I always said was, with all the managers I work with, honesty. You, you've already said that word, and that, that, that's what I would prefer. I would rather, he says, 
look, I'm not keeping you on because we've. Uh, I'm going with a different team. I'm going with younger guys. I'm doing this rather than say, well, my hands are tied behind my back. I would love to keep you, but you just say, no, I know you don't want to keep me. Do you know, so I think honesty is huge. And he's already touched on that as well. I, I think one of, for me, and this is kind of sort of sitting outside of the industry now, um, but still having a lot of connections within it. I think it's the, unfortunately, the industry allows that to happen because if you go to a, a, a solicitor or if you go to an accountant, there is an expectation of this process is this, 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 and this, and these are the things that you'll have to give me in order for this to work. And I know because a lot of that is legislated, that's, that's why they have to do those things that way. Um, but I think because there will always be the cowboys who do it cheap, easy, okay, Mr. Klein, I'll do whatever you want just to get a bum on a seat and to create that placement because it's all about, and again, this is how the business is set up and how they incentivize and manage their teams. And again, very short sighted. It's that, and you know, for, as I say, from somebody from outside, if that client was consistently not giving me feedback, chances are those clients are probably the clients who are a bit of a pain in the backside anyway. And it's easy for me to say, because I'm not relying on that client's business now, but I'd be tempted to almost, and I've, I have done this in the past, go back and say, I'm really sorry, this is all the feedback I've got for you. This is all I can get from my client. I've asked them four and five times. I've told them it's not going to reflect very well on them that I've got nothing more to give you, but I still can't get anything because actually what you're doing is giving that candidate a really honest view of that client. And, and I think sometimes you, you have to, and that's where the consultative bit comes. If you've done all that, this is the process. This is how it's going to benefit you. This is why I need it. This is why candidates need it. Did you do you want this person to come back? Especially when they say, oh, well, we really like them. And we would have, you know, yeah, they were a close second. But if that's all that they get, that's not going to be enough to maintain and engage that person. I think it is sometimes is, you know, you, you've got to make your decision about, is this the kind of client that I want to work with? Or do I want that reputation of I always get feedback because that's the, the process that we've got. And, and I know you can say all that and, and they can still at the end of the day just ghost you like they, they do because I'm sure that hasn't changed that much. <laughs> um, but it, but it, I think it is, it is one of the biggest frustrations, isn't it? Because you're that middleman, woman, whatever. You're that person in the middle who is having to manage both these sets of people and you don't want to upset anybody, but you also... but you know, tell them a bit of a fib, but how many, I don't know about you, how many people have been caught telling a fib about a candidate? Just to give them feedback? Yep, you know, we've all, we've all done it. And it's it's just, it, I did it once, maybe twice, and I didn't do it again because it's a horrible feeling. So that's just my two penneth on that bit, Tom. <laughs> I think that's right. And I think picking up on the point that, that Scott made about honesty that, and, and what Brian said about getting, you know, specific feedback, if you get specifics and you've agreed that with the client up front, so you agree, as you say, Brian, you know, you're, we're going to be doing interviews over these three days. We're going to set aside half an hour at the end to go through each candidate's. And bearing in mind, if you're a decent recruiter and you're managing your client properly, they're not interviewing 20 people. They're interviewing two or four people. So that shortlist, you know, the word is it's a shortlist. It should be short. So you're not talking about spending loads of time talking about 20 people. If you are, you're doing something wrong. So, you know, to sit down with a client, um, as Scott says, and get, you know, five or 10 minutes on his feedback, what that means is that when you give the feedback to the candidate, you're talking specifics. And it's difficult for the candidate to challenge that. And the reason why I say that is, just as you've pointed out, Helen, sort of pulling a few strands together, if you decide to make things up a little bit in the nicest possible way, to spare the candidate's feelings and you start getting questioned on things that you've just made up it becomes very very difficult to keep that trail and there's a i'm showing my age a little bit here but i i watch judge judy a lot and, and and judge judy always says one thing you know if you tell lies you have to have a very good memory yeah because you have to remember what you've said um and i was caught i put my hands up there and i was caught at once where i gave nice gentle feedback to the candidate um 
they didn't get the job and they said well that's totally different from the email the clients just sent me and it was like okay never knew the client was going to email you and i gave them a very very soft version of why they didn't get the job which was completely different to the fairly harsh feedback the client gave them um but i think if you if you don't have to make things up you know you don't have to have that that great memory it's like listen this is what john thought and this is john's decision and this is why john has made that decision it's quite difficult for the candidates to then, they'll still argue, don't get me wrong, and one of my other points is about candidates not agreeing with the feedback, but I think that's another topic, because they go through that immediate emotion of being rejected, being hurt, yeah. and, and if they get into an argument, if you're making things up or you've got nothing really specific, you can get into a little bit of a, an awkward moment where they say, why didn't I get the job? I don't agree that I was second best. I ticked every box. If you've got nothing to counter that with because the client has not gave you it, it makes for quite an unhappy ending, unfortunately. And I think people thank me for honest feedbacks. And, you know, just as you said, Helen, they have been a good second. Um, I was getting feedback about five, six months ago. Um, somebody approached me about a job and I, I'm currently self-employed, but, you know, I'm always interested to talk to people. And they came back to me and they said, you know, you were a really close second. Um I'd rather be nowhere, quite frankly, than be a close second sometimes because you're like, well, if I'd have done this little bit differently, <laughs> I might have got the job. Just tell me I was rubbish and let me move on. Um, but they gave me some good feedback. And, and to be honest, the feedback was the person they went with was doing that exact job at that exact moment in time for a very similar client where my experience was a bit more broad. Um, now, I can't change that because I'm not doing that job at the moment. So it was decent feedback, nothing that I could have changed. Um, but sometimes, as you say, Helen, when you go, you know, John really liked you, you were a good second, thanks for applying, it's not really feedback. Well, but I think as well... Tom, Funny, but, sorry. Sorry, I'm a strong believer in treating people like the way I like to be treated myself. I've, I've done that all through my life and all through my professional career. I'm a strong believer also in that my candidate today could be my client tomorrow. And therefore, uh, very much that's the way that all candidates, no matter their walk in life or their career path in life, should be viewed as. Um, I, I, you know, a strong, strong advocate of being very honest and transparent. And again, even if that may inter that candidate feeling a little bit down or, or, or despondent with the feedback that they get, at the end of the day is, is that if they are of rational mindset that 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 feedback will um, permeate into their into their 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 psyche o over time it may not immediately because obviously it may be too raw but at the end of the day is, is that there's no point in sugaring uh, sugar coating uh, feedback uh, or flowering it up you know at the end of the day that's a fact of life unfortunately that some people are better suited to certain things at a certain time than, than maybe you are at that particular time or with that particular employer. So, so therefore, you know, you need to be transparent and you need to be very direct with the feedback. And again, uh, going back to something that you'd mentioned earlier as well, Brian, is that I, I totally concur with you. The word consultant gets bandied about quite a lot in this industry. And, and I'm, I would like to say that I am a consultant, um, um, but there's very many people that I've crossed in my recruitment career. I would go back to say that they are fulfillment. They are not consultant. Um, and, I, and I think that that is something that the, this trend word of using consultant is, is used very loosely in the industry. And I think that it needs to be addressed because a proper consultant, as we've all been discussing this morning, and, and obviously I wasn't party to some of the other conversations that you've had, is that is somebody that works in unison with the candidate and the client in both parties' interests, all right, okay, to service both those interests and create a marriage, all right, okay? If they can't create a marriage, then that's either on the fault of the candidate or the employer. All right. OK. Or potential employer. All right. OK. And it's your duty as a consultant to 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 obviously best represent both parties in that arrangement. And again, that's by being very hands on with both ends of the transaction, for want of a better phrase. All right. OK. And, and I think, unfortunately, the industry is permeated by a lot of people who grab a CV, throw it in front of a candidate or a client.
Hello, sorry, I'm having technical issues. Can you still hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, the picture will come back. It's twice that's done this to me this morning. So I beg your pardon. So, so very much that, you know, I'm a strong believer that, that that's the true nature of consultative experience for both the candidate and the client. Um, and, and a very much a good consultant does challenge his client and his candidate to get the required feedback uh, and, and, and obviously deliver that impartially and honestly. Yeah, I think just going back, Matthew, you touched on, I was about to sit, sort of, um, and something Tom had said there. I think that's the key bit. We do, if you're any way competitive, you don't want to be a close second. And you're right, Tom, it's that bit when you hear, I think I could have done something else. But I think irrelevant if you go through an agency or you go directly to a business, back to that brand element is that something Matthew said, it might be pretty well straight away. But can you imagine if, if, if it's delivered by a consultant correctly to say, look, you know, the, the, this is the real feedback, it's correct, and you were close second. However, what happens in three weeks' time if that other person doesn't take the job? If it's been delivered correctly, you're going back to that candidate and saying they would like to make you an offer. Now, I know it doesn't always happen, and it's, but it's keeping that, that situation, whether it's consultant to candidate or hiring manager to candidate, very warm, that yeah. should the, the experience be, be a good one, albeit they've not got the job, they would still consider going back and using that agency, that yeah. recruiter, or going straight back to that company should they approach them or another vacancy comes up. And I think that's the, the key bit as well, that delivering what we are supposed to think about as bad news, um, it, that delivery is crucial to keep what could be a, a relationship open at a later time. I was going to say that to Tom. Uh, when he was speaking and say, well, what, what would have happened if the first person never took the job? And then it came down to the other two people that he was speaking about, one who accepted it being second and the other one that says, well, such and such, I, I, don't, I don't want that. How, who would he choose then then? Or would he have someone that he would choose? I think as Brian says, it's, it's about taste in somebody's mouth when it comes to that, you know, that, it's like anything, in any race, there can only be one winner. Um, but if you leave it with somebody that they were perhaps lacking a little bit, yeah. you can do good positive feedback in terms of anything else. I don't think there's anything wrong with going back and then being honest. You listen, their preferred candidate who takes every box, their circumstances, they're unable to take the offer up. Um, as I said to you, the client really rated you. You know, and, and they've decided that they're able to make you an offer and provide additional training, for example, in the area where you were lacking um, to bring you up to speed quickly. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. If it's left that the, the feedback is negative or it's just not really feedback, to go back a week or two later is a more difficult conversation because yes. then trying to butter somebody up, you know, I thought you were really great, you were really close second, you know, you lacked this, you know, experience. Well, why didn't you tell them that a week ago or two weeks ago? Um, so it really is about, you know, it, 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 Brian says, you know, it's a, it's a hard thing for people to build up their, their hopes on a job uh, and they don't get it. It's quite a crushing blow, um, you know, and if it, to, to then be followed up by telling them they've not got the job. Um, yeah. But um, it, it's all down to the delivery and the relationship. And I had, I've had loads of people, you know, I, I, work, I still work in recruitment and I work in quite a lot of, of higher level jobs. You know, and, and I don't think I've had anybody where I've had to give feedback to where they've not been successful, slam the phone down. In fact, the vast majority have said, please keep my details. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm more than happy to be considered for any other roles. You know, and, and I have gone back to some of those people, some of the roles I work under within the, the technical area of rail, you know, and, and quite specialist. And some of these people you can go back to and say a different type of role has now come up within the same company, incidentally, but it more suits your experience. You know, and, and, and we've done it that way. That's yeah. a Can I just say something as well, Tom? I really like that point that you just made there because um, when the feedback, not just from the client, is, is for you as well as a consultant. I'm a consultant. And it's like, actually, has this person got the technical expertise to do the job? There's a reason you put that person forward for a job in the first instance. So for having that feedback is then your idea to say, right, okay, Next time I'm working with you, this is what you need to be doing at that interview. This is what you should be doing, and this is what you should be putting on your CV because all those points have been raised. Yeah. And then you can go back and say, look, 
you weren't suitable for that position, but hang on, I'm working with you. You've got the technical expertise. You just fluff the interview. Yeah. And this is the feedback that you've got. And this is what you need to do for next time. And you, that's the whole point, isn't it? It's, it's that feedback that you need to get back from your can, for your candidates every single time to then go move forward with this and you're going to be suitable for this position instead. Yeah. And I think that there's, there's another dimension that's starting to take shape and just picking up the point you made there about fluffing the interview. I, for people who have not been successful because they've struggled with Zoom or with a Teams call, yeah. um, you know, what the, one of the companies I work with is, a, is an HR consultancy um, and the owner is an ex-HR director um, and, and we specialise in real recruitment. So we're talking jobs that are paying 50, 60, 70,000 pounds a year. And, and just as you said, technically the CV is brilliant. You know, they've got every certification, every qualification under the sun. They've got things on there that I can't even pronounce. And they go for a Zoom interview and they struggle with it. You know, and, and we prep them as much as we can because we do, we've done all of our interviews over video for years now. Um, so we've always, always done it that way. And we prep them and we go through and we talk. In fact, we've done videos on how to do a good video. With them. Um, the irony is some people can't even log into that to find out how to do the video better. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming up. some people. Um, you know, and, and it's difficult to get because you're trying to give feedback. And, and I've had feedback once that says, I think that's really unfair because clearly on paper I can do the job and, and that's why you selected me for the shortlist, which they can. But just because I'm not very good with zoom or video or, or whatever i didn't get the job if i was face to face i would have performed better you know and it's hard because that's how things are done these days so there's a whole new arena springing up about people coaching people on video interviews and and, and the preparation etc 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 quite right because actually we're proving that that can be the one you don't get a job and unfortunately some people don't prepare right no matter what you tell them the client still comes back and says you know, they struggle with this, they struggle with that. Uh, and it's a difficult one because it's back to that bias you mentioned, Brian. If, if somebody logs on and, and they're presented with somebody who doesn't even realise they're on screen and they've got an inappropriate background and there's dogs barking in the background, Helen, and there's people running about. <laughs> you know. Oh, I've missed you, Mr Waddle. <laughs> <laughs> Helen and I used to work together. <laughs> But that but that bias comes in straight away. It's like this person's not prepared, you know, they're not organized enough. And just as you've said, Brian, they're suddenly thinking they're not right for this job. And and they start to look for reasons not to employ them. Yeah. yeah. But would you not say Tom? I mean, because I as one of the elements with my private guys, I do that, I do interview prep. And it used to be, even when I was at Reed, we did interview prep with, with certain candidates. And it was about the day before, go and drive to the premise to see where the door was. All the usual, you know, standard interviewee kind of preparation. I was with a client again a few weeks ago, and they use a thing called Starleaf. I'd never used it. <laughs> there was Matthew. Um, I never used it. This guy came on six minutes right, late. Right, and he said, oh, right, I just... get Matthew signed up for one of your courses. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew's changed. Um, so the, the fact is, he the the guy used the, the company used a thing called Starleaf, and this guy came on. So I thought I thought it was a standard Teams or Zoom call, so I hadn't set it up. Now, when we were debriefing, the client said to me, "What's your take on that?" Because I'm pretty relaxed about it, and my view was, it's no different to if anybody was going for a face-to-face -face interview. Would you walk in six minutes late and say, sorry, oh, I didn't realise it was 25 minutes away. I thought it was only 20. Or I went to the wrong place. So I suppose, and you could say that's bias. You could say it's lack of attention to detail. It's lack of preparation. But you're right. We're, we're moving into an arena where this is becoming the normal, not the new normal, that this, is, this was going to happen, I believe, in 10 or 15 yeah. years. And again, this is so for me personally, this is not new. I had offices across Europe. This is how we spoke to each other. Because you can't get someone from Poland to come into the Czech Republic to meet someone from Malta and you fly across. You're spending thousands of pounds. You meet on this and you, you discuss it. So for three and a bit years, I've been doing this. But I'm speaking to people yesterday, the day before. This is all, oh, I, I, I hate it. I hate Zoom. I hate Teams. 
Well, unfortunately, Tom, you hit the nail on the head. This is the way an interview will go. And if you've got you know, your underpants hanging in the back, you're not going to get the job. Oh, but it's in my bedroom. Well, that's irrelevant. You know, we're, we're, I'm you know, checking we're there. Like, <laughs> Why do you think I've got this background? <laughs> you should see what's behind it. Um, <laughs> you, you don't want to know. <laughs> it's just a dungeon. <laughs> the fact is, it's a good point. Uh, we are behind the second. <laughs> I'm not switching this off ever. <laughs> and and with, you know, I'm going to go off piece, but I, I was reading about a company yesterday, a tech company, who have just come out and said, we're going to start hiring a global workforce. So they're, they're based in Edinburgh, but they're no longer going to say, we're going to just have people in Edinburgh. They're looking at bringing people in to work, not from another office, so not in Hyderabad, not in Beijing, not in the Philippines, but actually people who work out of their Edinburgh office. Because it's one office, because it's all going to be virtual. So if that is the case, as we move to more remote working, which was going to happen, just we've, we've condensed that, I believe personally, what would have taken 10 years, we condensed into six months. That are, you know, the candidate, the applicant, the job seeker, however you want to, you know, package that individual, they have to get used to this is the way you do it. And you're right, Tom, bias will always play a part. And we talked about this, I think, three sessions ago, Helen. You know, bias is there, but it's the same bit. What is bias and what is actually, hold on, you've come onto this call seven minutes late. This is an interview. And because it's something you're not used to, it doesn't take away from the fact this is a job interview. Yeah. And I suppose that, like everything else, how we did things 20, 30 years ago, that's moved on. But because it was a, a longer um, sorry, gestation period of something changing, that was fine because it took five years and we all got used to it. And as I said at the start, I used to fax my CVs. We also used to have a game with our neighbours, who are another agency. If we both had the same company, we'd run. It was like a sprint off. You can tell that was a few years ago when I could actually move. But we used to charge and drop stuff off to clients. I mean, what can sweat pouring off you? There's five CVs. Imagine that now. People would laugh at you and think, you know, what's going on? Because we've, we've moved on from that. Yeah. But similarly, those going back to those clients, if you're, if you're having an email um, relationship with a client, you're probably only going to get bad news anyway because it's not really that. But you said, Matthew, it's not that consultative approach. It is a... It's a CV sifter. Yeah. Well, Brian, just to pick up on that, is, is, is that, you know, very much, I'm, I'm, I'm a strong act. I, I, I totally concur with you that I think this technology is, is the way that a lot of businesses will go uh, forwards with, with regards to their hiring processes. I think, obviously, that's prevalent more so more in Europe itself than, than in the UK at the moment. But I think, obviously, we will catch up. And I think, obviously, as you say, this last condensed six months, has obviously opened up people's eyes a little bit more into the actual expediency of actually doing it this way rather than scheduling diaries. Are you in the office this week or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. However, to counterbalance that is that I'm still a strong advocate in meeting people face to face, whether that be client, whether it be candidate, because you get a totally different feel for somebody in person than you do uh, as, as much as it's been very nice seeing you all and introducing ourselves to one another this morning, it's still not the same of actually being in a room with somebody and, and actually, uh, for want of a better word, <laughs> being professionally intimate with them uh, rather than, you, you know, there's, there's still a slight remoteness or, or lack of connectivity uh, with still doing it this way, this way, if that makes sense. I, mean, I, I think I wasn't meaning that we'd never have face to face, but I think it's more for our candidates to be aware yeah. that there's now two very mainstream ways of being interviewed. Which, and as you're right, you know, people still want the face to face. I mean, I met a client yesterday, and oh, I went to shake his hand. That's how long it's been since I've seen another human being. And went, what are you doing? So, oh God, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, but similarly, I think that we, you know, we should be making people aware that. It's, it's no different, it's probably how I should have worded it, that it's no different to doing an interview with regard to preparedness for, a, for an applicant than it would be going to the actual you know, face to face job. Agree, agree. I think even more so because I think there's, there's still a casual element because you know, people talk about how they dress for you know, a video call 
than they would do for a face-to-face call. And, and a lot of people say it doesn't really count because there's almost a bit of a disconnect. It's almost as if they can't be seen sometimes. Um, you know, and, and I always say, you know, if, you, if you're going to do an interview, you still need to do your research and, you know, mm-hmm. How you would how you would appear on screen is important because again I've I've done interviews and I've thought they haven't made any effort you know and even allowing for the today's more casual attire you know doing an interview for somebody who's you know a, a leader of a of an engineering team and they've literally turned up with a t-shirt and a baseball cap on for the formal interview is is a no no mm-hmm. but you've got to be able to give feedback um, to, to somebody like that to say if you turn up like that for the client interview you ain't going to get it because immediately the client, you know, and you've got to have that, I suppose, that authority to be able to say to people, you know, that's not, how how you turned up today is not appropriate because if somebody turned up in your office like that, you probably tell them, listen, I asked you to turn up how you would be prepared for the client interview and this is how you've turned up. But I still get people who think video interviews are not real, Um, you know, and I think even more important because, you know, just as you've you've said there, Matthew, you lose a bit of that, connectivity that face-to-face where you can read people a little bit better yeah, definitely. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit stilted on a video and and you know you've got to just i always say just remove any opportunity for them to have any negativity about it. Um, so. i think there's also tom and uh, thank you it is it's also that potentially on these video calls is that people can use prompts and and uh, and props for want of a better word um to to actually maybe enhance their actual uh, organic interview uh, performance um, and maybe gain an advantage if that makes sense I think sometimes when you're face to face with somebody where you are directly asking them a question and expecting a response or a measured response or well thought out one that you know very much that there is no room for them to have a crib sheet in front of them or or a reference point to to actually maybe inflate their ability to answer the question in a more natural fashion so i i think that that it does have its advantages in the world that we now inhabit at the moment with the pandemic etc but i think also sometimes it can maybe give a false measurement of somebody's capability in, in that they may have information available or a laptop open in front of them, which has, uh, you know, other bits of pieces or research material, uh, uh, you know, that gives them an, a, an edge for want of a better, um, uh, you know, that an organic interview uh, may be where they, you would get a, a, a fuller and rounded impression of actually what their capabilities are. Okay, I'm just very, very conscious. Thank you for that. I'm just very conscious. I'm just going to pause the recording.